much Nicta for providing him, paying for his airfares. I five star accommodation? No. Not quite. Urban Nest, of course. Urban Nest. Oh, you need more toilet paper too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we've we've had that one from everyone. Oh, we bought ourselves. <laughs> no problem. Chris Fried is also a lecturer at ANU, and he actually talks at ANU on this particular topic he's chosen for you today. So, without any more ado, over to you, Chris Fried. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk about uh, what we are doing in NICTA. We are machine learning researchers, and uh, so before I go into tools or toolkits, I will tell you a little bit about machine learning, what the uh, problems are which we are facing when we are doing machine learning to get everybody on the same page. I'll give you a short uh, demo of Elephant and then I'll talk about the Elephant architecture and uh, implementation issues and then put that into a broader picture uh, what I think uh, machine learning in the future could be. So I'll just give you some examples, you know, junk mail filtering, you have a lot of emails, uh, a lot of them are often junk, so you as a user, you label them as uh, junk or no junk, and then uh, you feed a machine learning algorithm, which then learns what are your preferences. Now, I've only given you junk here, uh, you think your private mails are all the in here and uh, to each of these uh, here we would all label with uh, junk and the others would get a label no junk. So the task is learn to identify new incoming junk mail. So you can throw it away or put it in an extra folder. Handwritten digit recognition. 20 years ago that was a real challenge. Uh, people wanted to automate, it, automate the snail mail office so you had all these handwritten digits on your letters and uh, as you see you have very very different ways of writing digits so you take a lot of these as input examples and you tell the machine that this is a two and this is a two and this is a six and then hopefully you have chosen the right algorithm and the machine is fast enough uh, though that it can learn something about how humans perceive digits and then when you present it with a new digit it will hopefully recognize the correct digit. This is already a little bit more advanced here. We are given a set of photos of images containing natural scenes and we are trying to look at the statistics of the patches in these natural scenes. So we're taking five by five pixels here and uh, these patches here are sorted uh, by the uh, probability. So you see it's, these are natural scenes. The uh, most important colors are blue, whole patches of blue, probably sky, whole patches of green, probably somewhere grass or uh, something else in green. And then you get certain patterns and uh, you go on and go on. Uh, if you think in terms of uh, Fourier transformation, these are the lower frequencies, and then you go on to higher frequencies in, 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 in the patterns you find. So you take this, you learn the statistics over natural images, and then you take this information, you grab a new, not yet seen image, you put a lot of noise onto it, and we have deliberately not chosen uh, red or something which is not there, we have chosen green. Uh, and then you take the statistics which you have over the normal images from natural scenes and you are able to denoise this and you come up with this as a result. So you see here we don't have directly given a label, this is uh, yes or no, a junk or not but we are still collecting some uh, information about uh, what a natural scene is. It's not a randomly created set of pixels. It has a structure, uh, it has a, a certain probability structure for the patches. So 
if we generalize this a little bit more, so we have inputs, uh, we have possibly input labels which tell the machine this is what we want. Uh, but that's not always uh, necessary. If it's available, uh, we call it supervised learning. If it's not available, we call it unsupervised learning. We may have other information or other assumptions, like, for instance, statistics over uh, the natural images which we had here. And then we choose a model, a mathematical model. For instance, very simple, a polynomial model with some parameters. So that's the first step. We have to find the best model, which, of course, takes a lot of time to learn, because you have to understand which model is good for which kind of application task. But even if you've chosen a model, then you have the parameters. So you have to do a lot of experiments in order to figure out what the parameters, best parameters for your model are. So to make it even a little bit more general and formal, that is the definition of what machine learning is. And it's done by one of the famous machine learners, Mitchell. A computer program is said to learn from experience, E, with respect to some class of task, T, and performance measure, P, if its performance at task, T, as measured by P, improves, improves with experience, E. That is, it sounds silly, but I can tell you when you talk people to say, oh, we've been doing machine learning. Well, can you please define what is the experience you're using, what is the performance measure you're using to evaluate, uh, and how do you measure improvement? Uh, so it's good to keep that in mind. I want to stress another point here. Machine learning is not memorizing. It's not just writing all what you have in a big table and then look it up. It's more, and uh, usually we use the term generalizing because you have unseen examples which sit somewhere between what you have seen, and you want to generalize what you have learned about the other stuff uh, to these unseen uh, examples. And generalizing means you want to give a good prediction for what you want to get out of your machine learning algorithm for these unseen examples. So I'm going through a very small example here to just give you a taste of uh, what it means. I have a set of data points here. They are all scalar. And I have a set, each of the data points has a target. That's what we measure. Now we want to learn something from this data. So that's just a formal definition. I'm normally always writing vectors as column vectors to not confuse somebody. So that's always the transpose there. Makes it easier when you have to implement that stuff. Um, so the question is, what can we generalize here? So you can come up with many, many answers. One possibility is to say, well, let's assume we have some kind of uh, polynomial model. We want to fit some curve, some smooth curve to it. So we take uh, the input, we take some settings for our weights, and then we're calculating the output by calculating, uh, multiplying the weights with different powers of uh, the input variable. So this is just uh, shorter, and that is even shorter, uh, uh, the same thing. So that's a linear model. It's nonlinear in the axis because you have powers up to m in x, uh, but it's a linear function of the unknown model parameters. So the question is, how can we find good model parameters now for our specific problem here. Well, remember the definition two pages before, before, two slides before? We need to define some performance measure. And in our case, a good idea is to take uh, the difference between what we have seen in our data and what our function, our polynomial would give us and square it, so we, we take the squared error. That has a nice side effect that uh, we don't need to care about the sign, but it has much deeper reasons why a squared error is often a good idea uh, to take it as performance measure. And if the situation is not uh, 
very uh, strange. We normally have a nice minimum, so we can take this and we are looking for the minimum of this function, of this error function, over all possible settings for W, so that we find a smooth curve through our data. Simple model, we just take our input data really not into account. We're setting uh, m to zero while we are taking them into account because we're calculating the mean of our input data. So this, if we fit this model to our data, we will get the red line here. And I've also drawn here the, the other line from which the data were really produced, but normally you don't know that. The, uh, this is not visible. It's not given. So we can go a little bit further and take a linear function. Uh, well, that fits a little bit better. Our performance, our squared errors are going up, like are going down. We can take a, a third order polynomial. So that's already pretty good. I skipped the second order because you cannot f fit an odd data set to, a, to an even function. But we can go further. Say, well, why stop at three? Let's go to nine. Let's take a ninth order polynomial and oh, beautiful. It all fits. Our learning task is done. <laughs> and uh, the term is called overfitting. Because in this case, uh, if you have uh, n data points uh, given, so we have two, four, six, eight, ten data points, you can always fit it to an n minus one uh, order polynomial. Perfect fit. But you can imagine if I take another point which may live here, uh, my prediction would be somewhere up uh, on the slide. So that's not good. So there is a lot of theory behind that, uh, how can you avoid overfitting. The general principle is, take the simplest model which is good enough to explain your data. It's sometimes called Occam's razor. And it's a good guideline whenever you do science. Uh, don't take the most complicated model. This is a little bit uh, a more uh, different setting here. When we do machine learning, we generally assume, even if our data are in a very high dimension, that they are living somehow on some smooth surface with, which has low dimensions. So you can take all the pixels in your picture and it gives you 100,000 thousand dimensional spaces, but you still assume that the, the data are living on some smooth space in there, some surface there. It's, technically called a, a manifold. So here, for instance, uh, the data are really sitting on a two-dimensional manifold, although the whole thing is rolled up in 3D. So what you really want is you want a projection into two dimensions, which somehow preserves the topology of your data. Because if you can throw away dimensions, if you have not thousand, but only two or three, you can learn something about your data. You, you cannot visualize thousands of dimensions. So that's called nonlinear dimensional reduction. Uh, and uh, it's a very powerful technique uh, to look at nonlinear uh, data. Another application of the same uh, uh, technique here is uh, you take photos of uh, different uh, phases of the same person, but different face, phases. and uh, you throw them into 560 dimensions. Each pixel is one dimension. It's this grayscale value. But when you look at this and you do a projection onto two dimensions, you can learn something about uh, this phase. So here you have the really happy face. Here uh, more a neutral way face. Well, I don't know how you would describe this here, but move it. Really? Okay, <laughs> but it's definitely different from the others. Um. So what should these examples illustrate, besides giving you a little bit of a taste uh, how machine learning is done? Uh, we normally deal with very large data sets. 
lots of data, lots of dimensions, 10,000 dimensions, uh, very normal if you try to approach problems like uh, labeling images by, by their ob yeah, objects which are in there. You have to work with feature spaces which are 100,000 dimensional. You need to do a lot of experiments. It's not an algorithm where you say, okay, here are my data, plug it in, give me the result, thank you. Uh, you do a lot of experimenting. You do experimenting with different models. You uh, have to try different algorithms, different methods, and you also have to deal with different hyperparameters. The hyperparameters are the parameters like, for instance, the order of the polynomial. You have to set it from the beginning. You are not learning that from your data. And then, of course, if you do this uh, and you do a lot of experiments, you have to record the results. You have to document the results. And uh, if you publish a paper, you also have to make sure that uh, you're able to prove that what you have claimed in your paper has really been done. And one good way is, of course, uh, to have the code available and the data available. And then, of course, uh, if you teach, you would uh, <coughs> like some tool to help students uh, learning statistical machine learning without doing everything from scratch. So that was the motivation uh, why we started to build our toolbox Elephant, which we called Efficient Learning Large Scale Inference and Optimization Toolkit. The Elephant is written with F because uh, <coughs> the initi initiator uh, was a German, not me. Uh, uh, and the second person uh, was com coming from India. So the elephant is, has, does not mean it's big and bulky, but it's a wise elephant. So uh, I'll show you a little bit uh, uh, a demo here. So we'll switch over. And uh, OK. So you start with a, an empty slate. You can take uh, data readers, uh, writers. You can set filters. You can choose algorithms. And they are all coming as, uh, as building blocks, which you uh, can connect. Oops. So you plug the data, uh, for instance, in the test data. And then you go, can go on in your data flow. So you are really building a data flow. Uh, these connections uh, are sets of types. I'll come to that later. So you cannot draw any connection to any uh, port here. And on the left-hand side, uh, you have uh, explanation what the ports are. What, and uh, you have properties. Uh, for all of these uh, components here, for instance, you can choose different kinds of kernels. Uh, I don't go into the details what that means here. If I choose the wrong one, I get an error message. Before I build the whole setup now, I'll go back to uh, something uh, which I have prepared before. And the nice thing is uh, you can start an experiment directly from a file. So we have uh, a regression module here. We have some input data from which we want to learn. And then we have another data source which provides us the uh, test data. And then we want to use this uh, algorithm, which we have, or this machine learning algorithm, which we have learned to uh, output uh, our prediction. And then we plot that on a monitor. So uh, I'm just running that done. So. Uh, you see the blue diamonds are the input data from which we try to learn something. And uh, the red line here is, is a large number of, of test data, which then uh, takes the learned function and produces an, an a result on the y-axis. You can change uh, things here. For instance, we can go and uh, we can take another kernel uh, or we can change the scale uh, for the Gaussian here. 
So uh, if I put in a hundred, you get an error message because uh, don't know if you can read it. This uh, property is not a integer; it's a floating point number. So we have to provide a floating point number here. And I think I somehow have a problem because now my interface is stuck. Okay. So you can normally get all the data over the internet. You can provide URLs. You don't have to have the data locally. But uh, I did that locally here. And uh, well, you can change things in the plotting if you want. You can change colors, transparency, uh, the style of the line, uh, whatever. Um, if you're happy with your experiment, or even if you are not happy, you might want to save it. So you can save the whole experiment uh, as, uh, for instance, regression one. You quit, go home, and the next day you continue uh, by now asking for regression one. And you get back your setup. If you don't want to store the uh, the visual interface, you just want to uh, generate a code, then you can save your whole experiment as Python code and uh, oops this, oh sorry yeah. I should have tried that before. No, I didn't. Uh, I have problem with this 32-bit and 64-bit uh, on this machine. So what, what you really can do is you just execute the code because uh, it is plain uh, Python code. Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it's just pure Python code, so you can uh, execute it as Python code. You have all the parameter settings in there, which also means that uh, you will, you can easily reproduce your, your experiment because it's all stored here in this file. Okay. Of course, we can do other things uh, like uh, classification. So uh, we are given a set of data points. They all come from different classes. And we would like to figure out how to cover this area in such a form that uh, we can later find uh, another point and figure out to which class it belongs. So the algorithm is running. So that's the result you get uh, when you do that. Okay. Let's go back. So here, just to mention, uh, the people of our group have contributed. Uh, uh, Kishore Gawande is uh, my colleague. Uh, software engineer has done uh, the graphical user interface. And then we have many students uh, having contributed code. And not only students, also researchers contributing their code into the toolbox. So the whole toolbox is uh, provided under the Mozilla license uh, for Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. And uh, you can see this is an older version here because we had an extra data flow, but we got rid of that. I'll talk about that in a moment. I'll talk a little bit about the architecture. Uh, we have several layers. 
and we'll look at the lower part here. So we have external uh, modules which we use, for instance, uh, external packages, uh, C and C++, uh, very large scale scientific packages for distributed systems, solvers uh, for the distributed systems, and then uh, interfaces which uh, can take uh, C, C++ and so on code, which then is used inside of, of our modules. So we are heavily relying also on the SciPy and NumPy uh, implementations, which give us uh, the real fast uh, mathematical processing. And we have our own solvers and optimizers, uh, and then the different uh, machine learning algorithms. This is a complete functional API. On top of that sits, uh, oops, one direction. On top of that sits uh, a component architecture, that's what gives you the graphical interface. Uh, it wraps around the algorithms, it does pre-processing, model selection, visualization, and then you can build your applications with that. We have documentation, uh, of course. Uh, in different formats, uh, our own uh, scientific documentation, but also uh, Doxygen generated Python uh, C and C++ uh, documentation. The website is uh, elephantdevelopernick.comau and we have uh, also some mailing lists. When you deal with real data, you're dealing with a lot of different data formats which people have decided to store their data in. So for instance, uh, labels are differently used. For binary labels, you have minus one or one, or you have zero or one. Or if you have more than two classes, you have uh, from zero to n minus one, or from one to n. So uh, the data readers are basically shielding you from a lot of this complexity. Uh, you can define the uh, separators, you can define where the data in your file sit, and in which column the labels uh, or the label sits. We can also read da MATLAB data, of course, and create random data. We have a number of algorithms. These are just some examples. Uh, I don't go too much into detail here belief propagation, regression, classification, online learning, Gaussian processes, feature selection, and uh, some others uh, here. We have also uh, some modules which are not integrated in the graphical user interface. Uh, for instance, we have a, a module which can deal with very large data sets which don't fit into your memory. So it's, it's using the Intel thread library, which we don't provide. You have to get that from Intel but the rest which we provide is uh, open source. And then you already saw the uh, graphical user interface uh, for quick prototyping, uh, designing uh, application workflow quickly, share the experimental setup with other users, and uh, it uses the component framework to, for instance, dynamically questions the files which you want to load because uh, the MATLAB data, uh, they don't have a data format where they provide you everything in ASCII. You have to really question the data uh, and to figure out what are the parameter settings inside of the uh, MATLAB data format. And the loading and saving of the XML, of the experiment is done in XML. I'll come to that soon and, and we have, I hope you believe me that. We have uh, executed the Python code. So uh, when we thought about what kind of features we would like, we want some MATLAB-like language because people are very used uh, to write MATLAB experiments and machine learning. So that's why Python uh, was a good choice for us. Uh, it has its drawbacks. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but we need efficiency, so the libraries are in C or in Fortran. Uh, you can plug in your Atlas tuned uh, LAPEC and uh, Glass libraries. Um, we want reproduci 
reproducibility for verification, so we have these command line uh, executables, ease of use, the GUI, and then uh, the other things which I already mentioned. We want it to be to go out together to get with the papers we publish, so it has to be open source. But we also want uh, companies to be able to use uh, the code in their applications. Uh, so we made it uh, under the Mozilla license. I'm going a little bit into details here with uh, some implementation issues uh, for you who are programming in Python that might be interesting. Um, so I already mentioned we have the API and that was one of the main decisions that we said we want to have an API which is completely independent of all the graphical uh, GUI interface we have. So other people would like to use the GUI but how do you re reconcile that? The problem is uh, what do you do with your uh, instance variables? Uh, where do you store them? In the, in, in the algorithm which is accessible via API or uh, in the component, then you have to double it. So what we did is uh, we said, well, everything has to be in the API because uh, we want the API to be stand standing alone and everything uh, for the GUI is derived from that. But after that decision, we realized we can do more now because uh, when you, for instance, design, uh, define that you have a degree of two for your polynomial, and you're using that in your interface, you don't want a 2.0 or a 2.5 there, you don't want a floating point number, you also don't want a negative number there, and you might even want some extra information in your GUI what this number means. So what we did is uh, we used uh, our own custom uh, properties, so when you define a, a class polynomial kernel, you write down degree is custom property, it has type int, it has the initial value of 2, it can range from 1 to the, <laughs> to the max limits of integers, so this avoids getting negative numbers here, and it gets some explanation. So that means uh, when you have this, you don't need to do anything in the GUI, the GUI can very generically check whether the user had, has put in a positive integer number, and if not, uh, it doesn't work. It also allows you uh, to check the connections. If the data type you're providing here as an output and the data type you expect as an input is not uh, the correct one, then uh, you cannot connect these uh, two ports. How it's done is uh, we are tampering with the meta class. Meta class uh, is the implementation of a class in Python. So we override that, uh, and here you, when you create uh, a new class, you call this, and from there uh, you then do the adjustments. So you can easily write it in this form, as I've shown here. You just write degree is equal to this, uh, without having to do anything else. We found it a little bit uh, stressful, stressful that you always have to uh, define the execution flow when you work with the GUI. So we realized that for many applications uh, you have an ex execution flow. The graph itself is an uh, acyclic graph because the data are coming from one port and going into another port. The operational units, like for instance uh, the algorithm here, has a natural ordering. You need to first uh, do something with the train data because you can do something with the test data. So if you have all this information, then you can run an algorithm and uh, automatically figure out what is one possible execution flow. So we just define on each of the uh, components uh, the, the properties of each of these ports. Uh, whether it's an import uh, and what kind of possible data structures can go in there. Here in this case you can have uh, dense matrices and different kinds of uh, sparse matrices. 
And then you run a topological sort over all these components, taking the partial order into account. And you come up with uh, one of the possibly many uh, execution orders. When you want to save and load these experiments, uh, well, you get uh, pickle and unpickle and uh, dump and pickle in, uh, in Python. But there's a problem. Somebody has an idea what the problem could be? It works the first time, but when you have loaded data into your object, <laughs> it, un it, it, it dumps all your data out. So it doesn't really, it, it works, but it gives you a huge data file uh, for your object. So what we did is we uh, overwrote, uh, or we wrote our own uh, pickling and, uh, or technically speaking, our own marshalling and unmarshalling algorithm, which uh, is nicely supported by the properties because we know everything we want to know about our object is in the properties. So we can just write out everything from the properties and have a nice XML uh, representation which can then be read in and the experiment can be set up in the same way as it was saved. Okay, uh, how am I doing this time? Good. A few more slides. Uh, some problems and challenges. Dynamic typing in Python is a problem, especially when you try to work with a larger set of modules and uh, several people working on the same project. So you have to do a lot of good U tests to make sure that things don't break. Everything is public in Python that uh, just demands a lot of discipline. We are currently in the transition to Python 3 and uh, of course we are also depending on the NumPy and SciPy modules to go to the same level, uh, to the same version. Interfaces to Petsy and Tau, which are big systems, uh, they are also, of course, uh, changing when the, the versions on the other side change. And of, if you want to use these algorithms, uh, you don't always have a Python interpreter. So what do you do when you have an embedded system? Um, should we provide more uh, modules as C or C++ code? The direction we are looking into is, uh, of course, dealing with multi-core processors. So machine learning will benefit a lot from having multi-cores, but only if we rewrite our algorithms. Because a lot of the machine al learning algorithms are not easily parallelizable, because you have uh, algorithms running over graphs, uh, so you can't just do these nice vector uh, operations which you can do in linear algebra, where you just split things in partitions. Um, same for the GPUs, uh, we're getting more and more powerful GPUs. Uh, maybe open MP. There are interesting uh, projects which use machine learning to learn to optimize code patterns for compilers, uh, milepost and C tuning. That's an interesting uh, direction. Structural, uh, if we think about the GUI, uh, we could have uh, loops in our data flow and then we would get close to what Simulink has uh, in MATLAB, but we would have it for free if we managed to do it. And we, cause, cause we can think of an experiment as a block with some input and output, and then you can think about a hierarchical system. That's what we're currently thinking about. So, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, the elephant uh, was not chosen because the elephant is big, but uh, we continue to use the name. So that is a joke here, uh, but this is really the big problem uh, or the big challenge. We are not alone in the world. There are great machine learning uh, toolboxes. The Weka uh, from the University of Waikato. Uh, yesterday we had a presentation about uh, Hadoop, uh, Mallet, and there are many more. Should we not really go into the direction of uh, thinking about structures and protocols so that we can use data from one place, run algorithms in another place, send the result to a third place, which does another algorithm on the, on the data. And uh, that is probably the direction in which we will go uh, as, a, as a community. 
So that's the third point, uh, the fourth point here, protocols and structures. And there is a project at ANU and NICTA uh, done by Mark Reed and uh, Robert Williamson who deals with uh, what are the generic elements in, in, in machine learning when you want to define structures and protocols. And uh, really from the practical side, but also from the theoretical side, because in machine learning we are realizing that many different problems could be rephrased in the form of the other. So there is some kind of unification going on uh, so that we don't have to start from scratch coming up with new ideas uh, and solutions all the time. Other questions, of course, are, I mean, how do you support uh, users who don't know too much about machine learning? Uh, I already mentioned standard formats uh, for data exchange. What is an experiment machine learning anyway? Uh, so replicability might not be the same as, rep as reproducibility. That's uh, a thought I would like to leave you with. Uh, Chris Drummond uh, man, uh, put that out. The ability that you can, can run the same experiment with exactly the same result, what does it mean? You can reproduce it, OK. Like you, sorry, you can re replicate it. But uh, what science really is about is if I change a little bit, does the output also change, or that do I suddenly get a very different result? Or if I do get a different result, what does it mean that I get a different result? So that's uh, meant by reproducibility. So you're not trying to just get exactly the same number at the end, or the same result at the end. You really want to vary things and figure out what's happening there. And uh, of course, ongoing discussion, and it's going in the right direction that uh, if you are writing good papers, you should also write good code so other people can verify that what you have done <laughs> makes sense. Again, because replicability, just running an experiment and getting the same result is not very powerful. OK, uh, yeah, summary. I think uh, I mentioned all of these uh, things here. Um, and I think we are really done with time. So I leave you with the last slide. Uh, again, the uh, URL for Elephant, uh, if you want to look at what our group is doing here. Uh, NICTA has uh, currently 12 open source projects. You find all of them here under this address. And uh, if you're interested in the protocols and structures for inference, uh, there's a URL here. And if you want to learn something about machine learning, uh, you find 800 slides uh, about machine learning there. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your time. And Thank you very much, Chris Fried. Um, just lost this magnificent gift I have just there. This is, I don't know, in the other halls there, you've seen the gift here made out of macadamia nutshell, compressed, flooded. Lovingly restored. Wonderful. <laughs> Keep it <laughs> as a, a memento of this magnificent conference Definitely. we've had here. Yeah. For all of you, hope you've enjoyed it. We've got another one on in just 10 minutes.